Now I want to talk about an American movement, uh, American pragmatism. And as I mentioned, Nietzsche is a little bit pragmatic, although he says he wants to be more than pragmatic. But uh, I, I want to get uh, carry out that theme a little bit and see what real pragmatism is. Actually, there are several forms of it that we'll look at. The first form is uh, the pragmatism of Charles Sanders Peirce. Pronounce it uh, Peirce, not Pierce. And I think I spelled him wrong there, too. I think his uh, name is P-E-I-R-C-E, not P-I-E-R. So I'll say Charles Sanders Peirce, and you see his dates there. His background uh, is uh, in science rather than, than philosophy. He has a degree in chemistry, worked as a scientist for the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey for 30 years, but uh, became more and more interested in the problems of philosophy and mathematics through that period. In uh, 1887, he retired to Milford, PA, to work on philosophy, and he lectured on philosophy at various universities, but, uh, and I think he would have wanted to uh, get a, a position at a university teaching philosophy, but he, he uh, wasn't able to find a permanent job in that field. He uh, befriended uh, William James, who we'll talk about a little bit later, and James evidently uh, uh, provided some of his uh, financial assistance for part of his life, but he never actually had a teaching job in the area of philosophy, although today he's uh, remembered as a very important, very significant philosopher. He starts off uh, in opposition to Descartes. Descartes said, we should doubt everything, or doubt everything that it's possible to doubt. And then we settle in on the one thing we can't doubt, which is our own existence. I think, therefore, I am. Uh, Peirce says that's the wrong way to go. Don't start off trying to doubt everything. Begin only with the things that you really doubt. And, the things that, uh, and these are always things that you're trying to resolve. If you, if you have real doubt about something, then you probably have in mind a procedure by which you can resolve that doubt. And that's the only genuine doubt there is. If, uh, if I stand here before you and I say, I, I doubt that I have five fingers, <laughs> well, the question is, how would you resolve that doubt? I mean, what, uh, uh, it's not a meaningful doubt, so a person would say, although some philosophers would, uh, would question that. But a person would say, that's not a real doubt because there's, there's no procedure uh, by which to resolve it. Uh, and he says that uh, if you doubt only methodologically, uh, Descartes' doubt is sometimes called methodological doubt. Uh, uh, Descartes has a method where you doubt everything at the beginning of your philosophical thinking and then try to reinstate uh, these things that you doubted uh, by arguments. Uh, Peirce says if you doubt only methodologically, then you may be only too hasty to reinstate those beliefs that you really didn't doubt. I mean, you didn't really doubt them, and you're trying to find a way uh, to uh, reinforce them and, and get them back uh, uh, into the realm of knowledge. Uh, also, uh, Peirce supposes Descartes, Descartes' tendency to rest ultimate certainty in the individual consciousness. Uh, he uh, disagrees with Descartes' epistemological individualism. Uh, he says that uh, in real reasoning, and he's trying to say, how do we really reason? You know, how do we really get the truth? How, how do we really resolve problems? And he says, and this typical scientist, he, he says, we, we resolve our problems in community, you know, in discussion. You, know, you do your experiment, and I'll do my experiment, and we'll hope that they all come together. So there's a community operating in order to resolve doubts. If you, if you doubt that there's a, you know, such a thing as a Higgs boson, well, you uh, talk to your fellow scientists, and they concoct an experiment, and they 
analyze it together and they do the calculations and one of them says I calculated this and the other says no that's not right I calculated that and, and, uh, and then the third one says oh I agree with Bill uh, uh, his calculations and I don't agree with Sam and eventually there's a consensus that comes up um, so uh, don't rest ultimate certainty on your individual consciousness as Descartes did Descartes you know, came up with his reasoning uh, as a purely individual matter. Number three, don't do what Descartes did, uh, resting all knowledge on a single thread of evidence. Better to use many mutually reinforcing arguments like threads of a cable. Uh, not just one argument, I think, therefore I am, therefore uh, God exists because he's, we need somebody big enough to create me, and uh, on and on you go. Uh, no, uh, you, you want to come up with a, a whole lot of different experiments, a whole lot of different arguments, and again, it's kind of a more scientific mentality that the purse represents. Four, uh, Descartes supposed that some things are inexplicable apart from God, and therefore God must exist. Well, Peirce says uh, you never have the right to assume that never have the right to assume that anything is inexplicable. Uh, you, you never know. Tomorrow you may, may find an explanation for something that you said today was inexplicable. And then uh, number five, uh, in an article called The Fixation of Belief, we should uh, not try to base our cognition on absolutely certain propositions. Rather, we should simply base our thinking on propositions that are free from actual doubt. And of course, uh, you know, we may come later on to see that those propositions are no longer tenable, uh, but that's okay. I mean, uh, we, we may have to revise the things that we think we know, um, and that's okay. Uh, don't, don't worry about, uh, you know, coming up with something that's absolutely firm and can never be Revised, don't go seeking absolute certainty the way Descartes did, uh, but uh, rather uh, base uh, your find out what what do we know, what what is it that we have no actual doubts about, and then work out your system from there. You may have to go back to the beginning and change something uh, that you thought that you knew, uh, but uh, that's just the way it is. That's the way science is, and that's the way knowledge is. So you see, uh, Peirce is one of the first philosophers to put a huge emphasis on scientific method. And basically, he thinks that scientific method is the way to knowledge, it's the way to truth. Um, there's a book called The Fixation of Belief, I, I mentioned briefly, uh, where Peirce examines the psychology of belief formation. This is what I sometimes call the existential perspective. How is it that, that uh, I move from a state of doubt to a state of belief? Now, he says that beliefs are objectively true or false, but whether we believe something, that's a psychological, that's a subjective thing. Whether we believe something depends on how it guides our actions. A belief, he says, is that which a man is prepared to act upon. You know, this is kind of a pragmatic uh, uh, understanding of belief. A uh, person has sometimes been called a pragmatist. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, belief is uh, what a person is prepared to act upon. Doubt is an uneasy state of mind. Belief is a corresponding calm, a satisfaction. Uh, in, in my book, uh, Doctrine of the Knowledge of God, I, I make use of this idea, uh, saying that uh, to know something involves uh, a feeling of rest, a feeling of calm, a feeling that your task is completed, and I, I call it cognitive rest. Uh, this is, uh, but, but there's a kind of struggle here psychologically to move from doubt to belief. 
And that struggle to move from doubt to belief is called inquiry. Now, when you have an idea, you know, how, how is it that you can come to ideas that you're confident about? In other words, how do you fixate your ideas? And Peirce uh, lists several possibilities. One is what he calls the method of tenacity. Uh, I mean, these are all kind of tongue-in-cheek, of course. Uh, the method of tenacity is to hold your present beliefs against all challenge. Uh, we, we all know people in, in Presbyterian circles that are like that, don't we? Uh, hold your present beliefs against all challenge. Second method is the method of authority, that is, accept all the beliefs that are imposed by society or by the state or by the church. Um, then C, there's the a priori method, which is to believe what you're inclined to believe, what looks good to you. He says this is sort of an aesthetic approach. Plato, for example, believed that the distances of the celestial spheres uh, to one another, and he, remember Plato spent some time with the Pythagoreans. Uh, Pythagoreans had uh, discovered the Pythagorean theorem, that in a, uh, a triangle, the... Uh, uh, the, the square of the uh, sides, uh, the sum of the square of the sides is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. So they, they were, uh, the Pythagoreans thought that there were all these kind of interesting number phenomena throughout the universe, and you could sort of understand the world by reducing it to numbers and, and all. And Plato held to this uh, Greek uh, notion of the universe as uh, concentric spheres, the universe we live in here in the middle and then the outer uh, sphere and uh, eventually you get to the moon and stars and so on and so forth. And he thought from the Pythagoreans that there were, there were definite ratios uh, in the numbers that uh, uh, kept these spheres from one another. Now the Pythagoreans had discovered that uh, strings vibrate at uh, certain uh, rates, depending on the notes, uh, musical notes, or the musical notes dependent on the number of vibrations, so that uh, the, uh, uh, if you play an A on the piano, and I know they didn't have pianos then, but the A registers 440 vibrations per second, and then if you double that and make it 880, uh, then you hear the, uh, uh, the A an octave higher. So there, there are definite ratios between the musical notes and the vibrations. Plato thought that the distance between the spheres was proportional to the different lengths of strings that pr produce chords. Uh, Hegel thought that uh, every natural tendency of thought is logical. It can kind of be reduced to this thesis, synthesis, uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But... Peirce says that, that's not reliable. I mean, you don't know. Plato <laughs> never saw uh, the celestial spheres, uh, and uh, Hegel uh, doesn't know for sure, although he thinks he knows for sure. Uh, Hegel doesn't know for sure that all human reasoning can be reduced to this dialectical process. So uh, that, that's a wrong way of uh, trying to gain knowledge. Uh, this a priori that you, you presuppose a pattern and then expect all knowledge to fulfill that pattern. No, the real way to gain knowledge is, uh, and here we, we expect a drum roll, <laughs> we almost know what the person is going to say, uh, the, uh, uh, the real way to gain knowledge is through, through science, a scientific method. And uh, he, he calls this... Uh, Critical common sensism. This is inquiry guided by common sense certainties. So remember Thomas Reed and common sense. Uh, inquiry guided by common sense certainties, which are fallible. Um, so you, uh, you start with your common sense, and uh, you move on from there. You do uh, various kinds of reasoning. Um, there is uh, abduction or retroduction, which is forming a relevant hypothesis by 
uh, that will yield some knowledge. Um, if this happens, then uh, well, say I want to know uh, uh, what, uh, uh, whether, the, uh, uh, wh whether there is a Higgs boson. Well, uh, if there is, then this should result. So that's the hypothesis. And then uh, deduction would be determining the consequences. If there's a Higgs boson, then this ought to happen, and this ought to happen. And then induction is actually testing the uh, hypothesis uh, by its practical effects. Uh, so that would be the experiment that they're running in Europe to determine whether there's a Higgs boson or not. So uh, those, those three steps are part, part of the scientific method. And... Uh, and uh, Peirce says this, this is the way all knowledge ought to proceed, you know. Uh, if you want to say that you know something, you've got to be willing to go through those uh, kinds of scientific steps. Another essay of Peirce is called How to Make Our Ideas Clear, uh, especially in formulating hypotheses. Descartes said you can't believe anything for sure unless it's clearly and distinctly perceived. But uh, Peirce says you have to add to these criteria, not only clear clarity and distinctness, but also practical consequences. And if you want to know how two ideas differ, they may look the same, but if you want to know how they differ, they differ insofar as they entail different practical consequences. So uh, one scientist says, yes, there are Higgs bosons. The other scientist says, no, there isn't. Well, uh, our, our, what is the difference between these two positions? The difference is this one has these consequences. This one has these consequences, which are different. This brings us to pragmatism. Peirce defines what he calls the pragmatic maxim. That is, in order to ascertain the meaning of an intellectual conception, we should consider what practical consequences might conceivably result from the truth of that conception. And the sum of these consequences will constitute the entire meaning of that conception. That's uh, Peirce's pragmatism. To understand the meaning of a concept, you, you try to understand the practical consequences of that concept, of that idea. Uh, William James uh, and John Dewey went beyond this uh, to talk about a pragmatic theory of truth. Now remember, Peirce, uh, with Peirce, pragmatism is mainly a, a theory of meaning. Um, with Peirce, you ask the practical consequences of something in order to understand what it means. If you say, I believe in one God, what does that mean practically? Okay, uh, What is the world going to be like if there's one God as opposed to there being many gods or being no gods? Uh, so you test out the practical consequences in order to tell uh, what is meant uh, by one God.